Right, everybody, I think we'll make a, a start. And thank you very much for coming along uh, to our lecture this afternoon uh, for our 125 years of nursing education uh, celebration series, uh, kindly sponsored by Health Education England Thames Valley. Uh, I'm delighted this afternoon to uh, welcome Professor Hester Klopper from South Africa. Uh, she's an international academic leader uh, with an extensive um, network globally. And I first met Hester um, last year in Vegas, actually, um, at the um, Sigma Theta uh, conference. Uh, and I was felt very privileged to uh, meet somebody who was so uh, well-renowned uh, and was clearly held in very high esteem um, by all the colleagues there. Um, so Hester's recently been appointed as Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives and Internationalization at Stellenbosch University. And prior to this, uh, she was Chief Executive Officer at Fundisa, um, and that was from uh, January 2013. Uh, Hester is also the immediate past president of Sigma Theta Tau International, and she is the first person outside of North America to be elected uh, to the position of president of STTI, which I think is a great tribute to her. Um, Hester is a fellow of the Academy of Nursing of South Africa, a member of the South African Academy of Science and Art, an inductee into the Hall of Fame of Excellence for Nursing Research, and a member of the Institute of Directors of South Africa. Hester was also on the first South African to be inducted as a fellow into the American Academy of Nursing, and she's also a fellow of the Academy of Science of South Africa. Um, and most recently, in July of this year, Hester was inducted into the International Hall of Fame for Sigma Theta Tau International for Research, Excellence and Global Impact. Um, and I'm sure you will agree that um, uh, Hester is extremely well qualified to come and talk about her topic today, which is global trends and impacting healthcare. Um, and so do give Hester a very warm welcome. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here this uh, afternoon, and thanks for the invitation, Liz. And of course, uh, we need to say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. And uh, thanks to, to Deborah as well for then making the arrangements and inviting me to speak to you this afternoon about global trends that's impacting healthcare. So let me start off by saying congratulations to Oxford Brookes University and um, really the celebration of 125 years of contribution to nursing education. Uh, for us coming from South Africa, where the first people from the from Europe landed in South Africa in 1652. It feels like the other day when we walk around here and just engage with, with some of the history. So it is amazing to think about 125 years of contribution and congratulations to that. So what I want to share with you uh, today is to just speak about a bit the world we live in and what the world looks like at the, at, um, at the current moment then what global leadership will require because what we see it's really we all know it's a global village and we can be anywhere in the world within 24 hours um, then i will touch upon some of what i believe are, is the global trends that will be impacting the 21st century um, and the challenges that will bring and already bringing to us in terms of healthcare. and then I will conclude with some thoughts about the implications for policy, research, practice, and education. Um, and I hope that I'll be sharing some of the trends um, that uh, will, will really lay the, the um, foundation in terms of uh, asking questions and then engaging further in terms of what that means. Now, I also know that nurses are our own worst enemy, isn't it? We often say, oh, there's no leadership. There's no leadership. And then I think, oh, wow. Each and every one can fulfill that. But I do think it is important that I share with you a study that was done uh, uh, like two, three years ago. And it was a study done by Surrey and Gills that looked at what will it take to be a real global leader. 
Um, and you can see what they've done. They've interviewed 195 leaders across 15 countries. And at the end, what they did was, from all of the data, they clustered it into two, uh, 10 characteristics and five themes. And that's really what I want to share with you, because later I'll, I'll pull it through when we get to the end, in terms of, so what will it mean um, for policy, practice, um, and education? So what they did was that they highlighted that at the highest level, or the, the most responses, were 67%. That said, to, if you really want to be a global leader, you need to be a person of high ethical and moral standards. And I think that, and this was not just in nursing, this, is, this was general global leadership. Um, the next highest response was at 59, that said, provide goals. So, and I think that resonates with what we would know in nursing leadership as well, that you want to follow somebody that's got good ethical moral standards, that knows the way, that can give direction. And then the part that we often struggle with is that to communicate expectations. Um, we often have where we want to go in our mind, but then how to, to really get it to people that will be working with us. So um, going through all of that, then at the end, they clustered this into five themes. And I think these are most probably the, the essence of uh, what literature tells us in terms of what would be needed for global leadership. Um, once again, highlighting eth high ethical and moral standards. The fact that the person should be able to self-organize. If you can't manage yourself and organize, how can you then expect uh, people to follow? The next, uh, or number three, is then efficient learning and having an openness to, to diversity and flexibility. Uh, the fourth one speaks about nurture growth, really investing in people. Uh, where it's about thrive, positive, and uh, attitude of gratitude. Um, and lastly, connection and belonging, and really the ability then to make these connections and network. Um, and of course, it's always interesting for me wherever I travel in the world and try to understand how people make these connections and how networking works is that we will always end up meeting people that has never been out of the either city or province, um, but uh, still believe that they are connecting. And I think that's, that's part of, of the world that we live in, is that you don't always need to be in a different place traveling, but that these connections are becoming easier as uh, we are more connected across the globe. So wanted to highlight this and most probably later come back to what would be those challenges then in terms of healthcare. Um, of course, the other is essential part of being a global leader speaks to then having a global mindset, somebody that has been uh, able to be proactive, uh, exposure, and really shows a level of cultural competence and, and showing that ability to accommodate uh, the diversity. So that in terms of global leadership. Let me move on to highlighting some of those elements that I believe then um, speaks to the global trends that we are seeing. And, and on some of them I will just touch upon, and there, I think there's, there's a, a quite a number of those that I'll be highlighting, the, there will be people in the audience that are much more knowledgeable about those than I am. But I do think it's important to highlight um, then some of those traits. First and foremost, um, it's the new global agenda. On the 25th of September last year, the United Nations member states signed the declaration and all member state countries agree to the new 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So originally they said it would replace the, the eight goals and that those eight goals will continue and there will be an overlap. But very interesting, if we now look at the work that's happening at the United Nations and at different um, affiliates of the United Nations, it's very clear that the new global agenda is being driven forward in terms of what would the SDG means. 
by 2030. And, and almost nobody's talking about the MDGs anymore. Talking about the 17 uh, goals that were set within those 17 sus uh, sustainable development goals, 169 targets have been set to be achieved by the end of 2030. So what does this mean for us? I'll just go back in one. What we see on the left-hand side with the MDGs was that at least three of those goals were very clearly related to health. Uh, for example, number four, reduced child mortality. Five, the maternal um, health improvement. And number six was HIV, AIDS, TB. Very clear. What we see in the, on, on the um, 17 SDGs is that only number three now relates or clearly speaks about health and it talks about good health and wellness. So what this means is really the implication of a new discourse for health. Um, in the past it was very clear that the health agenda was very in the face. What we see now and with the work that's happening within the United Nations is that Health has become integrated with all of the other 16 SDGs. So for an example, what would this mean for us as nursing professionals and healthcare professionals is really understanding the role that, for example, health plays in global warming, that health plays to prevent poverty, that health plays in education. And it's really about that integration and thinking of the larger agenda than just being internally focused in terms of the healthcare. The next uh, trend that I do think is important for nurses to specifically take notice of is something that we often talk about, the social determinants of health. But it's now about how does the social determinants of health link into the 17 SDGs and how are they embedded and what are the implications for us and our practice for the future. And really starting to think critically what does this mean for us in terms of our practice. And in terms of the um, determinants of health, clearly how is it linked to economic stability? Does that exist in our globe? I mean, if uh, we, coming from South Africa, we got such a shocker that uh, just in the last week, our president, I want to say, made a very bad statement again, and the rand is like one to 20, one pound to 20 rand. You wanted to think, oh, is there something like economic stability, education, the social community, and the context of, of the um, whole social um, or the, or the social context and how that relates then to health. The third element that I think in terms of trends that we need to take note of is the status of communicable diseases and the changing health disease patterns. And I'm sure you are aware of, we hear this consistently, and more so when we listen at where health insurance wants to put the money. Um, they say they don't want to pay for curative care anymore. It's all about prevention. And the shift in terms of the, the status of what um, the world looks like when we talk about communicable diseases. Now, first and foremost is that in the, I want to say in the first world, in the developed world, what we see is that the lifestyle diseases has really is now exceeding the communicable diseases. Yet, it is impossible that we can ignore that for, the, for a future trend. For example, if, and, and this is an application that I love to use, and it's called World Mapper. So this is what the world looks like, a map of the world. But if we have to add in the statistics, for example, what the world would look like if we configure it according to TB, this is what the world looks like. And we see that mainly in the developing part of, of the globe um, that still huge challenges in terms of fighting TB. If we look at, for example, HIV prevalence, we are far from making the shifts that we should. For example, in Africa, where um, 
we continue to see that 99% of all cases of HIV is still in Africa. The same, for example, in malaria, where once again 99% of cases continues to be in Africa. So not a, a good picture if we then look at what is really happening in terms of, of the disease patterns. Although there's this global shift towards the non-communicable diseases, for example, and, and the second point that I've added in there is that diabetes is challenging the second largest economy, which is China. It has become their biggest health challenge um, and for, for the whole of the country. If the other part is right at the bottom, depression that affects 350 million people around the globe. So yes, we are, we are seeing these trends, but the challenge then in terms of global trends is how do we balance it with the communicable diseases that still remains a problem in such large parts of the world. So for example, if we then look at a global projection, uh, what they project, project the world will look like by 2030, uh, where we see at the bottom end malaria, TB, HIV, AIDS, but then at the top really being overtaken by the stroke, ischemic heart diseases, and the cancer. And, and we already see how this is, is escalating. And the question always remains for me is, as when we look at these trends, then what are the implications for us in terms of our practice? And how do we need to position ourselves in healthcare systems? So this is what the, the global life expectancy now looks like. And what we see around the globe is that there's not one country that has now, um, the way we will see a life expectancy of less than 40 years. So we all know we are growing older and people are living longer. And what are the implications of that in terms of healthcare? So let me share with you some of these changing demographics around the world. For instance, and this is the work that specifically at this point in time, this point in time done by some health economics at the World Health Bank. And what I'm showing you now is the demographics of Africa. And I'm highlighting specifically because of what you will see in some of the texts that, that the World Bank is using is that it is a phenomenon that cannot be explained and it's difficult to comprehend in terms of future projections. And the reason for that is really that massive growth of the population in the age groups between 0 and 14. So what you will see is that between 0 and 44, is close to, and we're heading there soon, a billion people on the continent of Africa. Now, in terms of population growth, that really brings about a huge challenge for the future. And where money would need to be put in terms of health systems. For example, what we've seen in our own country and some of our neighboring countries, because of the HIV pandemic, is that so much money was put into that, which is, of course, it's right. That's, it, 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 it's important that it happened. But on the other side, what we've seen is that no attention were given, for example, in prevention of pregnancies. So we've seen this huge population growth with no specific focus from governments to really look at what that would mean for the future. Um, if we then look at for example, what's happening in Europe where the population is on a decline. Uh, and what we see is that Africa, still a projection of where there will be a growth of 115% compared to Europe, which will be in a negative growth of 4%. So um, a, quite a constant, I mean, the other part is, is Oceania, Oceania with a 48%. But I mean, it's, it's really... Uh, the concern is Africa and what that will bring about in, in the next couple of years. So if we then specifically look at what is the median age 
within this population, look at Africa, 19, between the, the ages of 19 and 25. So that means those are the people who are still going to be the childbearing age and, and um, really lending itself to huge population growth. And especially if we then compare it, for example, to Europe, which is uh, 40 to 46. The next big trend, do I need to say much about this? <laughs> big data and the Internet of Things. Um, and yes, the reality is nowadays Big Brother is watching us, isn't it? Everywhere we go, everywhere we move, I mean, just becoming aware as you travel, walk in cities, cameras, if you walk on airports, cameras, it's all over. So. And I just wanted to show you this. I thought this was just what our life is about, the amended mass load. And at the bottom end, we now see if wherever we go, we talk about Wi-Fi and battery life, isn't it? That's almost become <laughs> our, our most important uh, uh, focus of the day, make sure that, that we have battery life wherever we go. And I thought I wanted to share this with you, where uh, there's a warning that says patients will be charged extra for annoying the doctor with self-diagnosis gotten off the internet. <laughs> and this is the world we live in, is that often when you end up seeing your patients that they know as much about their condition as that you will know. And what are then our role as healthcare professionals in providing the care um, that the communities would need? So if we really have to then start looking at what the world looks like, this is really uh, I think a better reflection of what the world looks like. And it's not the, the world map, but this interconnection and interconnectedness via, via the internet. So, and specifically what is interesting to me is, of course, the fact that often we would say, um, you know, the, the, the big hole of Africa and there's no internet connection. And what is very interesting is that you will see the huge developments that have taken place, place on the coastline of Africa, undersea, now connecting it with better fiber optics than you would find in most other parts of the world because of the new technology. So this really brings us then to starting to understand then, if we think about all of these connections and that we're and specifically South Africa and um, Australia, uh, won a joint uh, grant and with the development of what is called the square uh, array, the, the square kilometer array satellites. And what's happening is that at any given point between South Africa and Australia where these are based, there is this constant over and above all other parts of the world that data is consistently taken up. The sizes of that data that is taken up in a 24-hour space tells us that it will take at the moment, if we had to put all our capacity of the world together to analyze that data, it will take us at least 20 years to analyze one Days data that is captured around the world through some of, of, of the, of the um, capabilities that now exist. And I'm sure you will, you will uh, identify with this just about two years ago when I went to the computer store and I said I wanted to buy an external with one terabyte. The guy responded and he said to me, rather go for two with 500 megabytes. And I said to him, why would that be? And he says, you know, a terabyte is still unstable. We are testing it. What's happening in our life within a two years time span is that all of a sudden we are already talking about petabytes. And just to give an idea of what that, it's a quadrillion bytes. A quadrillion bytes. So if we start thinking about what's happening with all this data around us. And yes, we may want to sit here and think, okay, so how does that influence my life as a healthcare pr practitioner? It is about a world that I think lends itself to us that we've not started to understand in terms of the data that will be available 
to enhance healthcare systems. Um, the fact that any data that exists about us, our health profile, will be available anywhere in the world. And we see some of those technologies already being developed. So, where is big data taking us? <laughs> Most probably, yeah. You bought this, others also bought. And uh, I've seen, especially on, on, uh, in Europe, where some of the smart feature, features can actually order, can tell you, milk is on a low level, time to order your bananas. I mean, that's where it's getting, all these technology. And trying to think at the end, what would this mean for us as healthcare professionals? The next uh, trend that I think is influencing our, that, is, that has changed and will continue to change our world is really the landscape of social media. Where it's about the interconnectedness, where there is, it lends itself to different platforms of service delivery. And here I'm talking specifically in areas, for example, in China and Malaysia, parts that is rural and the same with Africa, where you will not find a educated healthcare professional, only the community care workers, but having that ab ability then to connect via different platforms and get the information that is needed. And really lends itself then, for example, to mobile technology use and, and the opportunities that might exist for telemedicine. And for those of you, um, who has traveled to, to parts of Africa, I'm sure, if, for example, if you get into some of the villages, let me use the Rift Valley, Valley in Kenya, is that you will see the shacks, and each and every one there will have two mobiles, for sure. So really providing us with that opportunity that mobile technology really opens it up to have access to health care. I think I've touched mainly on the technology part, but how this is impacting on health care for the future is also of, of um, note. And specifically so, I think the, the 3D printing arena. And uh, I'm sure um, you might be more aware of this than I am, because we are just starting to see some of this, but uh, last year we know that there was, there's, there's a case that has been written up in China where they've actually used a 3D printed vertebra and did an operation, a successful operation, in restoring a, a fractured vertebra from a 14-year-old boy. And these are the type of things that we will continue to see and that will, will change our lives in terms of what would be available in, in healthcare. The next trend that, of course, is of huge concern for us is the healthcare workforce and what this would mean for the future. So with this whole drive over the last couple of years with universal access to healthcare by the, by the World Health Organization, we have seen that the global uh, Work Health Force Alliance has a list of 57 countries that indicates a devastated, they are in a, in a devastated need of uh, needing health care practitioners. And from those 57 countries, 36 of them is in Africa. So if we then look at well, let me, let me say, when I travel to the States and my colleagues there talks about a healthcare shortage and speaking to what I see in some parts of Africa, I mean, it's, you cannot compare at all in terms of really what this means. So if we then look at, for example, the world in terms of, of health work shortage, this is most probably what it looks like. Um, I'm going to just skip that because I want to get to this last point. And that is that at the World Health Assembly, now in, in um, May, a new human resources for health plan was adopted by the World Health Assembly and the work led by Dr. Jim Campbell. If that plan 
that has been adopted needs to be implemented. The projections are that we need 15 million nurses in the next 15 years to ensure universal access to healthcare. Do you think that's possible? Who's going to train them? Where are the nurse educators? Where's the money? So what does this mean in terms of our practice for the future? If we start thinking about this is the need projected over the next 15 years. Because what we've seen over time is the trend that if we think back 30 years ago in terms of what was the practice of a nurse, I mean, we didn't see dietitians around, is it? We did the, the meal planning, is it? Uh, we didn't see the physiotherapists. But we've seen all these, and, and of course, very valuable professional uh, careers developing, and medicine are developing. The concern is, what will remain within the practice of the nurse? And what is it that we need to do to position ourselves to make sure that we will remain relevant? I think that is an important question to ask in terms of looking at some of, of these trends. So my belief is that the 21st century nurse is a person that we need to position ourselves in terms of a health systems approach. Where the, the focus is on a re-engineered primary health care. Primary health care like in community health care, preventative, uh, and not just looking at the, the curative um, services. With a public health, a, a very thorough understanding of what public health is about. Understanding trends in epidemiology. Understanding how do we put health programs together, how do we implement it, how do we evaluate it. So that lends itself then for the basis to work with other healthcare professionals. And the, of course the challenge is then, so how do we do this task sharing? Because what is also important to, to take into consideration in some parts of the world is how do we share our practice then, for example, with the community health nurse? just want to make most probably one um, comment here, and that is a couple of years ago I had a master student. She was from Malawi and did her, her work was to understand the difference in knowledge between a trained midwife and the traditional birth attendant. Do you know that that study showed us that there was no difference in the knowledge? That was quite a shocker to us. Thinking that the time that we spent on training midwives and then we're having traditional birth attendants that gets to be taught by the elders of the community and it's trial and error through experience and at the end when we really looked at, at the data was to, rea to realize that we don't make that difference. And I think it's understanding those elements that concerns me in terms of, so how are we going to make sure that as nurses we remain relevant and that we will have a space in the health system of the future? Another point that I wanted to highlight is the person-centered care. Once again, at the World Health Assembly, a resolution was adopted to shift towards person-centered care. What does that mean for nurses? You know, we often say these, but um, you know the, the saying that goes, these words as a meaning, they are implied um, indicators that World Health Organization in future will be looking at to understand and to make sure that countries will be implementing person-centered care. The other part that I think is a, is a challenge is to make sure that nurses practice to the full scope of their practice. And 
for what we are trained, what our education and training lends itself to. And then how do we then make sure, for example, as well, that we have advanced degrees that speak specifically to that. So if I then um, want to move towards, so what does this mean in our life in terms of the education, uh, practice, leadership, and, and policy? Is, and I just wanted to share this with you, and, and you can later go and read about this, is I think it's important for us to have a common understanding of what global health means. And recently we published a paper, and you can find it in the Journal of Advanced Nursing, where we've done an, an unpacking of what global health means and then what global nursing means, so that we can get to that understanding of if we have to engage in a global community, at least to have that basis of um, a similar understanding of what that, this means. So in terms of then having this common understanding, one of the things that I want to share with you, if we start thinking about our role as nurses within policy, what does that mean? Now, first and foremost, I think it's important as nurses that we get involved with international organization and engage with them. I know, you know, it's so difficult for us when we sit in one place and we have to do our daily work to think, so how do I get out of this? One of the things that I've learned over time with policy influence is that you can only make changes if you're on the inside. You cannot sit on the outside and say, we should, we should. So I want to challenge you in terms of getting involved with policy working here. groups that works in specific policy arenas. You can actually send an email, say that I want to become part of working groups, get involved. Sometimes it not, might not just be on the, on the international level, but also understanding policy within your own city, in your own environment, and there's a whole drive by the American Academy of Nursing speaking about nurses at the war table. So that's the other challenge for us as nurses, getting involved in policy, is to get involved. Go and look. I mean, often when you look at the newspaper, it says that you, get, you, are, you are invited to be, for nominations to serve on a specific board. Get involved. Get involved. That's where we can start making the difference. The moment that we show a nurse can speak as good as any other health professional, or for that matter, any other professional. Where, when you're at the table, and uh, a very dear colleague uh, who did a lot of work for the health, World Health Organization, Dr. Stephanie Ferguson, she did a lot of work with the ICN as well, she, you, she often says, you don't want to be on the menu, you want to be at the table. And that's often what happens with nursing. We are on the menu, but we are not at the table. And that's the challenge for us in terms of policy. So one of the initiatives that I wanted to share with you, and I, I invite you to go and look on the website, it is www.gapfon.org. Now, GAPFON stands for the Global Advisory Panel on the Future of Nursing and Midwifery. And it's an initiative that I was very fortunate to start off as part of the presidential call uh, of, of my term in um, SIGMA. But that work has now continued. And part of the work that we've done uh, for Gap Fund, let me start off where, where this idea started and, and how it got initiated, is that wherever we go as nurses, we often hear the story that there's no leadership. And the other story that we hear is that, for example, when we start started our engagement with United Nations, with World Health Organization, with the World Bank, what we would hear from leaders within those organizations is that nurses comes to us, different groups of nurses, and they give us different messages. Each one will bring their own message, but there's no unified, united voice for nursing. And it's very interesting 
that, for example, ICN plays a very specific role in certain areas of, of, um, of the policy arena and so many other nursing organizations around the world. But when we start engaging, we could not find a common platform for all nurses. So what we did through the work of GAPFON is to organize meetings around the globe in each of the regions of the world. And we've just now concluded that work in um, July in Africa when we had the Africa meeting. But we've been around the world. We've been in, Australia, in, in um, Southeast Asia. It was linked to the ICN conference last year. We've had meetings in the Caribbean. We've had meetings with, with South America, North America we had two. Uh, we've had one in Amsterdam where we invited nurse leaders from Europe and, and, and the UK. And what we hear around the world is that there are four main issues for nurses. The first one is nurses' ability to influence policy. And it's in different priority order in different parts of the world. But it's, it remains the policy issue. The second one is leadership. The third one is about education and education standards for nurses that are acceptably, uh, acceptable globally. And the fourth one speaks about work environment and practice issues. And we could, uh, around the world, every time highlight those four important areas for nurses around the world. So if you go onto the website, you can see um, this. I mean, there, there's some press releases from, a, from each of our meetings. And what we're doing now is to busy compiling a report that will be uh, hopefully completed by the beginning of next year that will be available to say, so how do we as nurses engage in these issues and work together to address some of the, the issues that is a, ch a challenge in different parts of the world? So my challenge in terms of policy influence is really to get involved, to engage, and to form partnerships and collaboration with nurses around the world so that we can work collectively to influence policy and use that window of opportunity. Where does this leave us in terms of the nurse, the 21st century nurse, in terms of research for the future? In your part of the world, talking about evidence-based practice is like, what? Can that be an issue for anyone? Because at the click of a button, you have access to the information, the best available evidence. That's not the case in other parts of the world. So what it really means is about working together and building a platforms of sharing evidence. Now, one lesson that I've also uh, seen that some of our very good, uh, well, our, our colleagues with very good intention around the world does, is that often I will get these emails that will say to me, we are a university in a specific city in the States. We have collected a thousand books and we want to send it to a school, <coughs> a nursing school in Tanzania. And I want to say, great initiative, well done. But do you know that's going to cost us like a year's fee for one student at university to get those books to Tanzania? Whereas if you want to engage in, in, in activities like that, rather enroll and subscribe them for journals, um, electronic journals that can be shared instead of doing some of, of those initiatives. So it's really just an understanding of how evidence can be shared and how we can collectively improve the lives of, of some of the communities. The other part is, and this is a plea, and that is to, as you engage in research and working in your research team, try to find a space for a nurse academic from a developing country. <coughs> Invite people to be part of your teams. It is absolutely amazing to have seen the growth that has taken place in some of our researchers that were invited to be part of teams 
of researchers in the developed world. And you might think, oh, it might be a big issue. But just making space for one or two people on your team make a huge difference in the life of people wherever they work. So please, in future, if you engage in research, open the door of it to one or two researchers who can then join um, your research work as well. In terms of practice, and I'm almost done, one I believe the 21st nurse would, how they would make a difference, it's all about <coughs> nurse-led care. That's going to be the challenge for us for the future, to show the difference that we as nurses can make in terms of interprofessional collaborative practice, but being very clear on the role and the contribution that we make. And I've got a saying on here that says, make sure wherever we go in terms of practice that we also develop the younger nurses in terms of leadership development and shine where you are planted. I often don't think we should say where you are planted because then it sounds like you're planted and that's where you have to stay, you don't have to move. But it's really um, growing our own timber and making sure that we develop the, the younger generation nurses. I still believe at the core it is about courage, compassion, care and being a change agent. That's what I believe is at the heart of nursing. So to conclude it is really about courageous leadership and it says it's easy to stand with the crowd but it takes courage to lead. And that's what I believe will make the difference for nurses for the future. The fact that we are willing to speak up, knowledgeable, really invest in our profession, and being able to make that difference in terms of intercollaborative um, practice, so, and to have the courage to care. Um, all of these others are, are we see it there, but it is about the courage to lead. So therefore, my challenge for each and every nurse is do not follow where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave the trail. I thank you.